so that we can get to it. I asked them to bring the table out today because I got to preach differently. Um, I, I haven't preached with a table in a long, long, long time. It's been a long time, but I felt compelled to do it this time because this sermon has to be preached differently than the others. Um, it was real quiet at, at our 7.30 service, the first part of the sermon, and then, of course, the power of the Holy Spirit fell when the glory came in the room at the end of the sermon. And so my prayer is that it will be the same way here, that you may have to take uh, an opportunity to be reflective and to think, and it's going to be a lot of cognitive Im uh, impartation, meaning that I'm going to pour into you so that you get divine revelation. And you know, if God leads you to restoration and or uh, leads you to celebration at the conclusion of the matter, then so be it. That is his will. Uh, I, um, it's a heavy weight because this is heavy lifted. And the territory that God has called me to minister to you in, it's really, 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 really heavy. And as a pastor, I've had for two and a half weeks, I've been praying, and I've actually even had to fast on a, a couple occasions just to make sure that I get my mind right and be ready with my, in my spirit strong enough to carry and handle the weight of what I'm going to present to you, what I'm going to give you on today. So it's not a regular sermon. This is not going to be a regular service. It's not going to be, you know, business as usual. There will be some things that are going to be kind of different. Those of you who are visiting us and as our guests, we welcome you. We thank God for you. Those of you who are watching us, I, I'm grateful that God has moved on your heart that you would tune in to be a part of this process. But I just want to make sure that I assure you before we get started, this is going to be different. Tell your neighbor, this is going to be a different worship experience. It's going to be different. It's going to be different. Turn with me to Luke, the eighth chapter, verses one through three. Luke, the eighth chapter, verses one through three, King James Version. There's so much information that I'm going to put into your spirit, into your hearing, into your lap today. So much information, so much information, and I want you to begin to write it. But just in case you're not able to write all of it, I don't want you to be dependent upon this. This will become a crutch because you'll say, oh, I just get it later. Don't, please don't. I want you to write it because it's going to mean that you're intensely listening and that you're capturing it. And they're going to put things on the screen so that it's not going to be just completely thrown at you with no regard to you visually being able to capture. Any visual learners in here? Yeah, that's me too. I need to see it. So I get that. And because of that, I'm going to have you text the word deliverance to 38470. Don't worry, I'm going to get it. You're going to see it later in the service. I'm going to give it to you again so you don't have to write it down right now. But I'm going to have you text 38470 and text the word deliverance. And those of you watching me, and then sometime during the week, I'm going to have all my sermon notes. So if I, if I got scribble scrabble, if there's misspelled words, if I, that's just what I'm preaching from. So y'all bear with it. I'm not sending it through copy editing or any of those dynamics. I'm literally just going to send you my notes so that you can have access to everything that I have and that I'm going to present to you on today, okay? Okay? Come on, this is that kind of service. Y'all got to talk like y'all. Yeah. Slap, slap your neighbor until they weave, shake a little, little bit and say, hey, he talking to you. He is talking to you. Talking to you. And I'm just, I'm hopeful, I'm prayerful that God will cause this service to be so transformative that your minds and your lives will be different. If there's people in the foyer, let them in. If there's people in the foyer, let them in. If they're in the foyer, let them in. Because a lot of times what they do is they'll stand out there until I read the scriptural text, and then they'll let them in. And that's okay and acceptable. I just want to make sure that if there's anybody out there that they have opportunity to come in. All right, here we go. Luke, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 8. When you found it, say amen. All right. We're going to stand for the reading of God's word, and it says as follows. I'm reading from the King James Version. And it came to pass afterward. Come on in. Come on in. Come on. Come on in. I'll wait. Come on. Y'all got babies. Y'all got precious cargo. I can't wait till our student ministry is up and running fully, and we got, whoa! It's coming along. It is completely framed out. You can go in now and actually walk, walk into spaces and see the actual formation of the rooms. And so I'm super excited. I walked over there this week, and 
I was going through and I was giving Jason a tour and I was like, and this is where the young babies will come and this is where the student ministry will gather and I'll show him the actual form now because the rooms are completely framed out and I'm super excited. The next step is to have the village come in and give us our approvals for plumbing, et cetera. Uh, get an electrician to come in and then put the electrical in. So we're moving right along. I just need you not to forget that we can't move and y'all don't move. The scripture says, money answereth what? All things. And I didn't go to a bank and get a loan for this. So it is at the mercy of all of us to make sacrifices so that our babies can have the best possible facility for their space. We got comfortable situations and seating over here. So please understand, we want them to have better than we have on the other side of the wall. Amen? Amen. Amen. In addition to, they're building a wall. I saw that in the plan. Well, I saw it in the plan, but i actually seen it in person now. Right on the other side of this wall, they're building another wall. So the wall will be double wide. It'll be double thick, as well as they're putting sound deadening inst insulation in between that wall that they've already framed out. So they're not going to hear us. And oh, bless his name. Uh, I felt the Holy Ghost right there. <laughs> It's going to be quiet over here and quieter over there so that they can teach the babies and they can have a, a, a worship experience conducive to them. Amen. amen. Some of my teachers just say, amen. God bless and keep you. Amen. Luke, the eighth chapter, verses one through three. We're in now. Let's read. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him. Who is him? Yeah, y'all got it. This is a smart crowd, too. I thought 730 was the only one going to get it. Jesus, in verse 2, and, a cert and certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, called Magdalene not because of her name, but Mary Magdalene. Magdalene was the place that she was from. It was the note. It was a denotation or demarcation, rather, of her origin. It was the geographical location of the region that she had come from. So she was, it would be the equivalent of saying Mary from Magdalene. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went how many devils? Seven demonic principalities. She was arrested. Her life was consumed, mind, body, and soul, by seven demons. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Stewart and Susanna and many others, which ministered unto him of their own substance. Let me back up. Verse 2. And certain women which had been healed, healed, which means they were delivered, of evil spirits and infirmities. And Mary Magdalene, out of whom came seven, seven demonic principalities. Here's the difference. I need you to do this. First thing I need you to do is pray for yourself. Pray now that God would open your mind, open your eyes, give you understanding, give you wisdom. Don't worry about who's looking. Don't worry about who's praying. You pray for yourself. This is you going for you. You have an opportunity and permission to be selfish right here. Just pray for yourself. Pray for God to literally begin to minister to you through the power of the Holy Spirit, that he would change something on the inside. If you don't do it, you can't expect it. You don't expect it. But when you ask God for it, you do it with anticipation and expectation. Come on, believe now. Believe now. Believe now. Believe now. Pray for yourself. Pray that when you leave here, you leave transformed. That everything in your life is different and better. And that you leave with the peace of God, the joy of God, the restoration and healing of God. Come on. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. It's you. This is, this is you for you. If you don't go for yourself, can't nobody go for you. Come on, go now. Okay, now, pray for the people on either side right now. Come on, believe God that there will be no hindrance, there will be no obstruction, there will be no distraction, nothing that will keep you from getting and keep them from getting, rather, what God has for them. Come on, pray like it is yourself. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Pray like it's you. At home, you need to be praying for everybody in here, and here we're praying for you now in the name of Jesus. Come on, pray for restoration, for healing, for revelation. Pray that they will see clearly. Pray that something on the inside would be changed, that a switch would be flipped, and they would get the divine revelation and impartation of God's spirit and grace upon them, that what he needs to do in them would be manifested, it would be made known, and it would be accomplished. Pray now. Come on, believe God. 
Now pray for the person on the other side. You prayed for this one. Pray for that one. Come on right now in the name of Jesus. Open your mouths and pray audibly. Set the atmosphere in this place. Change the circumstance and the situation of your, of your, of your setting. Come on, the environment and the atmosphere needs to be charged with the power of prayer. Because we can't get here and we can't do what God has assigned us to do unless we got praying folks in here. So believe God. Now I need you to pray for me. Pray that God will use me, that I literally become God's servant and that he would anoint me so that everything that comes out would be pleasing in his sight and that yokes of bondage would be destroyed. Come on, pray, because the Bible says if you smite the head, the sheep will scatter. So his attacks against me are really meant to keep you from getting what God has for you. Since I am the sent man, since I am the shepherd of the house, since I am the, the mouthpiece and the mantle of God is upon me to preach to you, he does not want me to be in the mind that I need to be in. But pray that God would arrest my mind and take authority over it and I keep my mind on him and he keep me in perfect peace. Come on, I know, I'm not, I know it sounds and seems selfish, but I need it because I need you to get what God has for you. In the name of Jesus. Now pray for everyone that is lost. Pray for everyone that needs healing. Come on, you got people around you. You got people in your own house. Pray for them now. Pray that God will use this moment to saturate you and that it will permeate into them and that you would start seeing the manifestation of his grace and glory upon you. Come on, 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 come on. In the name of Jesus. 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 In the name of Jesus, amen. Come on and praise God for what you're expecting him to do as you take your seats. In the name of Jesus, and it is so. And it is so. Uh, this has been an incredible uh, two-week journey, two-and-a-half-week journey um, because of this sermon series alone. Um, those of you who don't know, myself and, and a couple of other pastors, we get together and we collaboratively write our sermons and put our series together because we, we feel like iron sharpens iron. We learn from other, one another, glean from one another. Each of us reads something different or comes across something different, and so we'll share it and shoot it to each other and say, have you seen this? Did you see this? And then, of course, as God uh, individually, independently leads us, we will share it with our congregation and see the power of God and the glory of God manifested and revealed um, in magnificent ways. So uh, it, it, it has not just been an isolated journey, but even some of the pastors, or one of the pastors specifically, um, Pastor Chris to be exact, has already preached this, and he has already testified of how powerful the outcome of this sermonic selection has been at his church. And so I know that I got to pray in church. <laughs> I got a praying church with a praying group of people who realize that there's power in prayer. And so if he had a phenomenal time, I said, well, I can't wait to see what God does at victory because I know it's got to be powerful. I'm going to preach for a few weeks on this particular sermonic topic, and this will be the theme or thematic uh, uh, scriptural, uh, thematic thread, rather, for this month. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a simple title, but it's a powerful title, and many of you probably will shout just by the title alone because you can testify that you've been in this, place, in this place or this position. But I'm preaching from a mess to a miracle. I knew I'd, I knew I'd call somebody's number that they realized I was a mess, but the fact that I'm still here with even breath in my body and in my right mind is a miracle. Any miracles in here that know you're a miracle? If you know you're a miracle, tell your neighbor, I'm a walking wonder. As if you knew the hell that I've been through, if you had seen all the mess that I've been. As a matter of fact, if you knew the mess I made and God kept me through grace and through mercy, you would know that I am a walking miracle. And so I want to give us an opportunity to see it from a textual uh, uh, perspective, uh, from the text of Jesus Christ, but also from a contextual perspective, which is really in the context of our own experiential knowledge and our own life and lifestyle, that God can, God will, God shall take us from a mess to a miracle. Don't worry about it if, if you're in a bad place right now, if you're in a dark season, a down season. Don't worry about it if you're under attack, if you're in attack. Don't worry about it if the enemy has brought you to a place that you feel like you've messed up beyond repair, that there's no reparation, that there's no restoration, that you're never going to come out, you're never going to get out, you're never going to come up. 
don't worry about it. Don't sweat it because I, God sent me today to, to help you understand that he will take your life from a mess to a miracle. And, 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 and fret not because I, I understand that there are some people around you who are super saints. <laughs> super saints. Super saints, they annoy me so badly. Oh, my God. <laughs> Super saying, y'all know who super, those of you who haven't been here and you don't know your pastor or you don't know me well enough to know what I mean, let me break it down. Super saints are those who saved, sanctified, five baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, and they never made no mistakes in all their life. You know, the ones that look down on you, but they're down there, so they can't really look down. They got to look at you because if, if they skeletons come out the closet, if they junk come out their trunk, if they open the door, you're going to see that they are really still in a mess and in need of a miracle. So I, I want to help us today understand one facet of this, and we're going we're gonna to continue this, this study through the month, but I want to help us begin to study it today. Before I do that, let me do this. Please help me thank and praise God for qualified, competent, capable help. And I praise God for this young man of God who's incredibly anointed and gifted, and I can't wait to see what God does in his life and ministry. But last week, I had a preaching assignment that was outside of victory, and I didn't have to worry not one bit. I don't think I even had to tune in and pay attention to what was going on in the sermon because Reverend Seth held it down last week. Amen. I miss you already. I miss you already, but of course, I want to release him to be all that God has assigned and, and called him to be. That's why he came. He came to leave. <laughs> and it's hard. It's hard being a parent um, uh, and releasing your, your sons and daughters out into the world to carry out the assignment that God has allowed you to groom and train them because you want them to stay at home forever. And First Lady has already told me that... that that ours are, they're going to be welcome forever and that even when they do leave the nest, that she's going to have an apartment down the street. I don't think they like that idea too much, but she don't seem to be changing her mind. Say it with me, a mess to a miracle. Okay, let's get into the heart of it. Please pay attention. I promise I'm going to go fast, but I got a lot to throw at you. God, give me preaching power. Give me grace and anointing. Let this be different. Let it be effective, let it be transformative, and have your magnificent way. Get the glory out of this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So I want to talk just for a second about the state of a modern church and where we are as a people, where we are as believers. Now, when I say the modern church, I don't mean just Victory Cathedral Worship Center, but I want to make sure that I extend it to the church universal. That means every church that is uh, that exists now and that, is, that is, is, is relevant and prevalent for preaching and teaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Lord, that he's a risen Savior. We are in a, a, a condition and we are in a place in the modern church where we don't deal with one facet of our existence that is necessary, that is absolute, and that is true. And, and can I even be, you know, very transparent and very candid? We're just talking today. I need y'all to understand that. That's why I had them bring this table out because I didn't want to get too excited on the front end. Otherwise, I won't finish the back end. But even in my own upbringing, I, I had a relationship with God because my parents ensured and assist, insisted <laughs> that I had a relationship with God. But I grew up in a denominational tract, in a denominational setting that really was more ritualistic than relational. Because it was more about the form and the formality than it was about the freedom. I remember and I recall when we introduced drums and bass guitar into our worship experience and uh, it was like we had to fight tooth and nail because the senior saints were like, oh, this ain't no honky tonk. <laughs> I remember the verb. I, I remember the verbiage and everything. I can actually even see this. I'm sorry. I can actually even see these people's faces. <laughs> you can tell that it wounded me deeply. It scarred me for life. I need deliverance. And so, but what I, what, I, what I remember and recall is that, of course, it was about the rigidity of, of the process. And, and, and as a result, there was no introduction of certain spiritual dynamics, except that it came through um, my father or my mother. I remember coming to my mama. Mama, you remember this? Um, the day I came to you and told you I quit. I ain't singing no more at this church ever again, period. I'm done. They so dry. They so dead. It's so lifeless. 
They don't say amen. They don't do nothing. Then I used to be, this is my biggest pet peeve now, but I was so guilty of it back then. Then I would get up and I would fuss at the people. Y'all need to what, praise the Lord. God been better to you than this. Say amen. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't do it like that. I know better, so of course now I do better. But I used to get up, and when I say I used to beat the hell out of them people, I used to beat them down. Y'all act like God didn't give you breath in your body. And so you know better, you do better. But what I was fighting against was not physical. What I was fighting against was spiritual. And so what I've concluded and what I've come to the con consensus of uh, is that this day, this modern church, the traditional church, Church Universal now, and even more so now and increasingly every day, we have gotten to the place where we no longer understand, talk about, or even deal with the spirit world. Anytime you start talking about approaching or dealing with the spirit world, people get uncomfortable, they get nervous, they get afraid. You know, some places and some people have never heard of anything called demon possession, demonic principalities, demons, spiritual warfare. No, there's some people and no, no slight to them, but because of the culture and the contemporary culture of what we are in today and what church looks like today, there are some people who don't even know nor understand or have an inclination of heart to deal with the fact that there are people who are demonically possessed. And it is amazing to me that we can ignore a facet that is so prevalently discussed and dealt with throughout Scripture. That you talk about, you know, demon possession of, of, of a man and it cast out, it was cast out and sent into the pigs. And talk about the demon possession of a little boy who rolled around and had seizures and gnashed with teeth and and, this, and, and he spoke to the demonic principality, and it was cast out. Talk about the demon possession of a little girl who was following behind Paul and, and Silas, and she was declaring, hey, y'all listen to them. They're telling people how to be saved, and they cast a demon out of the little girl. And, of course, the owner, the slave master of the little girl, got mad because it was a spirit of divination or fortune-telling, and they were, and they, now it was messing with their money. You, you talk about the demon possession of this woman who was in this text who was delivered by Jesus Christ, and she had seven Seven demonic principalities. And so over and over and over and over and over again throughout the scriptural text, it talks about demon possession. It talks about spiritual warfare. It talks about demonic principalities that arrest people, that take authority over minds and bodies and lives, and, and it ruins people's in, in, internal selves, but it also destroys everything connected to them or anybody that gets in their path. And we as a church, we have gotten to the place, and I don't mean, again, as victory. I'm talking about the church universal. We as believers, as the body of Christ at large, we don't deal with it. We don't talk about it. But we need to begin to deal with the principalities and the spiritual warfare that is happening right here, right now, every single day of our lives. For two and a half weeks, I've had to deal with prayer and preparation. And for two and a half weeks, the enemy has fought me with every attack that he could launch in this season because he knew that if I ever made it to the pulpit today to preach this particular sermon, that the people that are watching me on the Internet and the people that are in this room might stand the chance of deliverance and salvation. He knew it. And has attacked me with everything that he could possibly attack me with to distract me and keep me not focused on this but focus on the mess and all the attacks. And, but when you know and understand the spirit world, you'll understand that these things are not coming at you because it's a person. It's coming at you because it's a principality. It's a spirit, and it's spiritual warfare. It's a demonic attack that comes in spiritual form. My dad used to say this when I was growing up all the time. The devil is not going to show up in your, at your house with a red suit on, with, with horns, and with a pitchfork in his hand. That's not how he's coming. But he comes in a spiritual way to arrest the minds and arrest the hearts of people. And he uses people to get to you to cause you to be distracted and not fulfill your purpose and your assignment. Are y'all with me? He'll use people. He'll use media. He'll use all the other things that are vices that he can get access to, which really seeds through people. And that's how he comes. And, they, and, and I, want, I want you to look to your left, look to your right. Look down the road. Look all the way down the road. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Look down the other way. You at home, look at me. Look around. Look around the room. Here we go. Now watch this. That's what the demon looks like. <laughs> it, 
In case you don't know, Satan loves to come to church too. And I'm looking at you at home too. Satan loves to tune in. Satan loves to show up. Satan loves to be in worship too. Remember that when Jesus was up preaching and teaching in the synagogue. Now watch this. Jesus, the son of God, the incarnate embodiment of Christ, the, uh, of God himself, 100% human, 100% God. Jesus, wrapped in flesh, born in a, swad born in a, in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Jesus, who turned water into wine. Jesus, who dealt with spiritual principalities. Jesus, who healed the deaf, made the dumb to talk, the, the lame to walk. Jesus, who, who spoke to death and caused death to release uh, Lazarus and he had to come out of the tomb. Jesus, who stepped out on the bow of the ship and spoke to the elements and they had to bow down and worship him. Jesus, who had authority. Jesus, who had power. Jesus, who could speak and things would become. Jesus, who dipped his finger in a, in a, in a barrel of water and it turned into wine. This Jesus, the powerful for almighty, everlasting, eternal God. In the beginning was the word, words with God, word was God. Jesus, the word made flesh. Jesus, that Jesus. Y'all know Jesus? Jesus himself is standing up in church, in the synagogue, preaching the word of truth. And the Bible says there was an unclean spirit. There was a demonic principality that had crept in to the sanctuary. And that when it heard the voice of Jesus, he said, wait a minute, I know you. In other words, I know your voice. And you got to understand that if Jesus is up preaching and Satan wants to sit in the sanctuary, we don't stand a chance, y'all. That surely when I'm up preaching, Satan still wants to come and sit in the sanctuary. But I need you not to miss it. Satan is not the persons that you looked at. It's a demonic principality. He is a demonic principality, a demonic force with demonic imps that he issues and demonic darts that he launches to try to distract you, to try to derail you, to try to steal, kill, and destroy you. And, and, and here's the thing. We don't deal with the spirit world even though we are Spirits wrapped in flesh. It's not about your flesh. It's not about your body. Because watch this. When you leave, your body stays. But your spirit leaves your body. However, we're more consumed about the flesh than we are about the spirit. When we're actually spiritual beings who are just wrapped in flesh. So you've got to be mindful of that. This reality that it is biblical. It is scriptural. It is real. It is true. Spiritual warfare is a real issue. But there are demonic principalities. And when you start understanding this, what you're going to start doing is you're going to start seeing. And you'll see that people are not your problem. Ephesians 6 and 12 says we wrestle not with what? Flesh and blood. But spiritual principalities, wickedness in high places, the rulers of darkness of this world, uh, Satan is known as the ruler of darkness of this world. He's known as the, the ruler of, he's the prince of the air of this world. So he rules the airwaves. He rules the spiritual principality, the, the tracks of, of entry, the wiles, the ways in of this world. And when you start understanding and seeing it as what it is, you'll stop thinking that people are your problem and you'll stop dealing with the people as much as you're dealing with the spirit. Am, are are y'all with me? There is nothing, and this is the other thing, because when we start talking about this, a lot of people shut down, a lot of people get afraid, and a lot of people are intimidated because they feel like, oh, my God, this is deep, this is spooky. Let me tell you, I'm probably the, less deep, the, the least deep person you're going to ever meet in your whole life. I'm very practical. I'm very foundational. I'm very, I'm very transparent, but I'm also, I'm, I'm also very real in, in the how of this world. So I don't want you to think that it's coming from this deep and spooky place. It's just coming from this true place. It's coming from a place that we need to now wake up and start dealing with what we need to deal with and stop dealing with what we don't need to deal with. Y'all just holler if you hear me. There is nothing you have to fear. You do not have to be afraid of spiritual demonic 
forces, and principalities. So I don't want you to walk out of here afraid and intimidated and like, oh, my God, the spirits are after me. I need you to understand that you have both power and authority over every demonic principality that the enemy launches at your life. You have nothing to fear. You have the proxy of God's power through the name of Jesus Christ. And the spirit of God that works within you gives you authority and confidence and courage. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for thy rod and thy staff. They are with me. They comfort me. Thou even prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, just as sure as demonic principalities are coming against me, goodness and mercy are chasing me down from the other side. And they're going to follow me every day of my life. I don't have nothing to fear. God has not given us a spirit of, but of love. You can't be powerful and scared at the same time. <laughs> love, power, and a what? So he says, I'm going to teach you the vices and the ways of the enemy so that you'll know how to counter him and your tactics will be great. You'll have tactical strategy to know how to defeat him because he's already defeated. He's just convinced you that he's still relevant. Ah, this is going to be good. This woman had seven demons. Her life was a mess. Seven demonic principalities that had arrested areas and components of her life that affected, I'm sure, everything that she did. Her life was a mess. Why? Because she was filled with demonic spirits. The scripture says she was filled with seven devils. That's why her life was a mess. And you got to understand, if you start seeing and seeing clearly, you'll, you'll know and you'll, you'll pay attention to the fact that the things that are happening around you in the world, they're happening because, not because people are just losing their mind and going crazy. They're happening because demonic principalities are being released. There is a spirit of, of, of murder that has been loosed in the earth realm. Anytime you have an individual who can be so mentally consumed with a demonic principality that they walk into an elementary school with a loaded automatic weapon and take out classrooms full of innocent little babies, I need you not to just write it off as that's someone who's insane, but I need you to start seeing that that's, that is not just an isolated incident. But if it can happen there and then turn around and happen in Orlando and then turn around and happen in Las Vegas and then in Colorado and then the statistics look like they look in Chicago and then they look like they look. Please understand, it's not an isolated incident. It's not somebody who's crazy. It's a demonic principality that's roaming throughout the land seeking whom he may devour so that he can mentally completely take control of an individual's actions and cause them to wreak havoc and implement a spirit of murder in the land. But if you only see it as, as a problem, here's the thing, and I, I, don't, I don't fault them, and I celebrate their efforts. Please don't get me wrong. I don't want you to take this the wrong way. I celebrate them being passionate enough to march for something that they believe in. That is one of the, the keys of, 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 of exhibiting the authority is to be able to march. It goes all the way back to civil rights and even beyond that, that when the children of Israel came out of, of the wilderness, they marched out of the wilderness. So there is authority in that. There is, there is, there is a, a message that is sent. So please don't get me wrong. I don't want you to think that I don't support what they're doing. I believe that if they're passionate about it, they should take a stance. They should march. But everybody's marching. And they're marching because they feel like we need to have more gun control. But where are the people of God who realize that you can have all the gun control in the world but if you don't get control of the demonic principalities, they'll just find another method and another way to do what they're trying to do anyway because it's not about guns. It's about a demonic principality that has taken authority over the earth realm. 
And it's now escalating to the fact that when I went to school, I didn't go to school scared. Only person I was scared of was my teacher because they could paddle back then. Come on, think about it. Only person I was scared of was, was the fact that they would pick up the phone and call my dad and he gonna come across the street and whoop me in front of all these people. That's what I was scared of. You, you think about it now, you can't even sit in church without having security. I need you to see the escalation of the demonic warfare. It's escalating. It's getting worse. It's opening up to now where you are. I never grew up with a concept of security in church, armed security in church, police officers in the front yard. It, was, it wasn't something that I even could conceive when I was growing up. But now we don't function without it because we realize that there are demonic forces and principalities that are at war with the things of God, and they're taking it out even against the people of God, where churches, man, stood outside the church and just shot up the whole congregation. Come on now. You got to see it. You got to open your eyes and see that this is not just a physical fight, but there's a spiritual warfare that is happening, and, and, he's, and he's wreaking havoc, and he's doing the three things that he promised he's going to try to do, and that's to steal. If you're with me, say amen. amen. So today my prayer is that God would help me to help you. Here's the, here's the topic. Here's the foundation. This is why the enemy has attacked me so hard. Deliverance. The whole premise of this sermon is to illustrate, to illuminate, and to tell us that we can and that God wants to and that he will deliver us. There is deliverance. So let me help you understand what deliverance is. First of all, deliverance is the expelling of demonic principalities, forces, or demons. It is release from demonic attack. Deliverance. It is when, deli it is when demonic principalities are served their walking papers and given their authoritative notice that they are evicted from your life. That's what it means to walk in deliverance. And in order to do that, let me deal with the seven demonic forces. And, and please know that this is not an exhaustive list. This is not complete. These are seven that we have come up with and we've concluded are the most prevalent that are existing in the church and in the universally in the body of Christ now. First of all, there's a spirit of Antichrist. And the spirit of Antichrist, is, it has one focus and one focal point, and that is to remove Jesus Christ. It's not overt. Many times it's subtle and it's even covert, but it is prevalent and increasingly so that everything around you is trying to remove Christ from the equation. Y'all can see it. It's, it's, it's in everyday colloquialism and it's in everyday contemporary vernacular. There, there was a time when we used to say Merry Christmas. Then it went to Merry Xmas. And now it's just Happy Holidays. Because there was an effort to remove the Christ out of Christmas. Easter is no longer about Easter. It's about Peter Cottontail or the Easter bunny or Easter baskets or Easter eggs. And to show you how twisted we are and how much we've been consumed, we will highlight and celebrate a rabbit that lays eggs over a Christ that carried a cross. It's all an effort to remove Jesus from the equation. And this is not a new fight. This goes all the way back into a biblical era when King Herod issued a decree to kill all the babies, the newborn babies in the, in the, in the nation that were two years old and younger. The effort was to try to kill Jesus Christ. And so it's not a new fight, but the spirit of Antichrist has been ongoing and fighting us even from the day of Herod. It's just now escalating his efforts. The enemy is escalating his efforts and he's causing us to get to a place where we are, we're not even recognizing what it is anymore. We're just, we're wanting to be politically correct. I can't say that. I can't really mention the name Jesus because it's not politically correct. We're more consumed and concerned about being politically correct than we are scripturally correct. And we're more consumed and concerned about offending somebody than we are helping somebody receive deliverance. Are y'all with me? 
The spirit of antichrist, another spirit that is attacking the church is the spirit of compromise. You can no longer even tell what people really believe. They'll say things like, I know what the Bible says, but, you know, this is the modern times. This is the new time. This is a new day. I know what the Bible says, but this, you know, th that's, old, that's old school. That's old fashioned. And, and we've gotten to the point where now the compromise is so significant that we don't even call sin, sin anymore. We call it a weakness. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it's my struggle. That's, that's just my weakness. No, that's your sin. From the pulpit to the back door, sin is still sin. It's still sin. It's still sin. It's still sin. It's not your weakness. It's your sin. And the reason that God would give us instruction that we should not sin, please understand, he does, it's not that he does not want us to enjoy ourselves, to have a good time, to have a praise party, to, to really have a, a, a great time and enjoy life. He said, I've come that you might have life and that more abundantly. He didn't say, I've come that you might have a dry, dead, boring, mundane life, but abundant life. So him telling us that he does not want us to sin is not because he's trying to keep something from us. It's, he's trying to keep destruction from us. He realized that sin destroys everything that it touches. And so to keep you from being utterly and consumed and destroyed, he, he then prohibits you from participating in that because he knows what it will do to you ultimately. But then when you don't admit that, you are now operating in a spirit of rebellion. The spirit of rebellion, you know it's wrong, but you just choose to live that way anyway. And I've heard people that say things like this, you know, this is just where I'm at right now, Pastor. This is just where I am. You know, I'm, in, I'm just in that place right now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a work in progress. This is, this is where I am. And when you begin in the spirit of rebellion, here's another, here's another one that, that is attacking the, the church of Jesus Christ, and it's sexual sin. You have people that sit right here on your road who are addicted to sex and addicted to sexual uh, um, implications or pornography and, and other things that are sitting right here in the sanctuary, right next to you, right now, on your road, right now, right now. Watching me online right now. And, and we don't talk about it. We don't deal with it. We don't discuss it. We sweep it under the rug and act like it's not an attack. But it's an attack. And so, so you know, just to break it down for you, sexual sin is any, any, any sexual activity, any sexual escapades outside of the context of marriage is sexual sin. Are y'all with me? That's, that's if you get down, if you go down, if you low down, if you get up, if you get up with, if you do, if you don't. How you do, who you do, what you do, when you do, in sex, outside of the context of marriage. If you watch it, if you fantasize, I got to break it down because y'all act like, oh my God, I don't, oh my goodness. No, 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 no. Any and every thing outside of the confines of marriage, is considered sexual sin. And there are people right in, in, in line with it that are being attacked right now, which says that there's even a need for deliverance here in the church. Another one that, that causes, that, that, that is a, uh, a derivative of this concept, another attack that is being launched against the body of Christ, is greed. It's the inability to be satisfied. And here's the danger of greed. The danger of greed is it's attached to slavery. Slavery, in our context and for our understanding, is debt. And we've even gotten to the point where we're now excusing slavery or excusing debt that we've now mislabeled it and we have what we call good debt and bad debt. But here's what the scripture says. The Bible says that, oh, no man, nothing but a debt of love. So anything that you owe is actually enslavement. Good, bad is slavery. You can mislabel it or label it however you choose, but the Bible says that the borrower is slave to the lender. And so now it causes uh, the, the spirit of greed causes us to want more even when we have enough. To the degree and the extent that we will go and we will enslave ourselves 
to get more when we already have enough. Are y'all with me? If you can't say it, man, just say out, because I know I'm in your row right now. I'm in your section. I got it. Can you get sick? Can you, can you miss work? Can you miss a check? Can you stop and not make a payment? No. Because then the slave master comes, blows your phone up, sends letters and messages to your house, hunts you down, tries to find the car, puts an eviction notice on your front door, sends the sheriff's department to remind you, you're my slave. Here's how greed creeps in in this way. The world has fed us a system that says the more you have, the more blessed you are. The, the bigger your house, the bigger your bank account, the more of the fashion brands that you have. It's always amazing to me, the people that have money, don't, you don't even know they have money. They wear the most raggedy clothes, drive the most regular car. You don't even know it. But because we, we have become consumed by the spirit of greed that has attacked the body of believers, now we will go into slavery in order to impress people that are just as enslaved as we are. The Bible says that the blessings of the Lord maketh rich and what? That no sorrow people piece does not just mean that I have the ability to, to pay it, but the no sorrow piece means that it doesn't affect my entire life. If I don't, if I miss something, then I, and I and I have to, if I'm if I get sick and I miss work, I'm not stressed out on how I'm gonna do whatever I got to do. That's the no sorrow. Then the next spirit that attacks the church, another spirit that is attacking the body of believers, is idolatry. Because once you start getting all these things, you then begin to worship something outside of God. An idol is anything that you put before God. Let me say it a different way. Anything or anyone that you put before God is an idol. And if you worship that thing, you are an idolater. The spirit of idolatry has ransacked us to the extent that now we'll put any and everything before we put God. It's amazing to me that as pastors now, we have to kind of think through, schedule around. I don't do it, just so you know, but pastors in general. Schedule around and position our worship experiences, events, functions, godly, God-led, God-centered, God-focused, we now have to be considerate of when they're having a football game, when the basketball championship is coming on, how long the services are, irregardless of if, if it's a move of God or there's a powerful revelation that needs to be imparted, we've got to work around the other gods. I'm preaching good to myself. <laughs> Football is a God now. Soccer, baseball, basketball teams are gods now. We worship them. People sitting in two feet of snow can't even see the field. But out there with coats and blankets on in two feet of snow to worship the pigskin God. <laughs> we worship our sororities and our fraternities. We got more pride about our fraternal organizations than we do about our Christian brotherhood and sisterhood. We wear our letters big, bold, proud with all our colors on there. We'll fight over them colors, but we won't fight over the cross. I feel a weight. <laughs> I feel a weight right here. I need my intercessors to go and talk to God on my behalf right here. Tradition. That's another spirit that has arrested the body. The spirit of tradition. In the church world, we become more affected and more affixed on a seat than the Savior. If you don't believe me, sit in somebody's seat that they sit in every single Sunday. Y'all go sit back there on the usher's row and see don't they escort you out and back there. We 
bit more consumed with who's sitting where and who's in my seat than we are with somebody. Please, take, take the seat because if you need Christ, I need you to hear him. I need you to feel him. I need you to get him. I'm more consumed about that. I'll stand. Matter of fact, I'll go stream. I'll go outside and give you up my seat because I want you to be able to receive this word that you need in your spirit and your heart. Are you with me? We're more consumed with the method than we are the message. Let somebody get up here and have tattoos and piercings and, 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 and watch how the super saints shut them down before they ever open their mouths to speak. I, I, I get frustrated when, when people are so saved and so consumed by the spirit of tradition that they refuse to change their methods in order to get the message in the hands and the hearts of the people that need it the most. I'll never forget when I started the church because I dressed like I dressed, and I dressed even worse, I guess, is in their perspective. Because I wore warm-up suits. I had on Jordans. I had on Jordan jogging suits. When I first started the church, it was all casual. I mean, when I was casual, I was, this is dressed up. This, I might as well have on a three-piece suit today. Because when I started the church, it was real casual for me. But the older I got, me and my kids start wearing the same things. I knew it was time for me to change over. I said, no, one of us got to go. I'm going to let y'all have it. I go back every now and then just to visit, but I ain't going to live there. And so I, I remember that somebody approached me and said, you don't look like a pastor. But well, that's because that person was consumed by the spirit of tradition, and a pastor only looked one way. I ain't wearing no clergy collar. If I wear a clergy collar, one of y'all done died. I ain't putting on no robe. It's too hot. And my presentation might be at a table and not at a pulpit podium. And my podium is made out of metal, not that big hunky piece of wood that does not move that we grew up looking at that big old cross that's etched in their own, and we don't have no communion table down here every Sunday. But people who are consumed by the spirit of tradition are more caught up in the method than they are the message. Are y'all with me? We can get into traditional styles of worship where there's never a variation. There's never a change. Everything is ritual, and nothing is relational. Nothing causes us to experience the move of God. But here's the thing. You, you, when you do that, you learn to do church without God. And when you do church without God, you do church without the power of God. And the power of God is the only thing that can change a man's heart. But because of the spirit of tradition that has arrested us, we refuse to move when God moves. And the end result is that changed lives don't ever happen because we don't change our methods. Now, the message never changes. It's the word of God. It's the truth. It shall remain. There was a pastor who dressed up like a homeless person. He was the new pastor of a congregation. And he came and he sat at the back steps of the church. And he didn't ease his way on the back row. He tried to sit up front, but they wouldn't let him sit up front because he was dressed like a homeless person. And then finally, when they got up to introduce the new pastor, he made his way down the aisle. And all the people that didn't speak to him, all the people that didn't pay attention to him, all the people that didn't give him second looks, all the people that looked with disdain that nobody wanted to pray for him, help him, and even talk to him, all those people had to pay attention to how traditional, how the spirit of tradition had arrested them to the point that they would not even honor the responsibility of every believer. Whatsoever you do to the least of these, God says, you've also done that unto me. But the spirit of, the Bible says this, that, that, that tradition makes the word of no effect. Because you, you get so caught up in the ritual that you lose your relationship. Let me help you all out. Quit talking about my people up here on stage. Quit worrying about what they look like and start listening to what they're singing. Let me say it one more time in English. The spirit of tradition kills the move of God. Here's the thing that you don't understand. You don't know where these people came from and how close they were to suicide, to death. You don't know how far they've come on their spectrum of achievement. And if you can't see that, then there's no reason for you to be judgmental about where they are in this season. Because if you had seen them in last season, you would understand that where they are now is an improvement because they were a lot worse where they came from. 
You worried about their clothes in the sanctuary now, but they didn't have no clothes on when they were twirling on the pole. Let me let that just sit for a minute. I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Here, here's the thing. It takes God to break down a man's heart by revealing himself to them. I can't preach enough, pray enough, sing enough. I'm not powerful enough. I'm not able without the grace and the glory, the anointing of God, which destroys yoke to come on my life. I'm not able to cause anybody to see where they're wrong. But you let the Holy Ghost fall on my life. You let the anointing of God take over and take authority of my members. And there'll be people that are laying at this altar on their face because they realize and they see from the power of God that there's a need for transformation and change lives. Are y'all with me? Here, the, the presence of God is a drawer, but when you get caught up in the spirit of tradition, you stop drawing. And when the spirit of God gets on a, a, on a life, it changes things. Here's, here's what tradition does. Tradition, tradition is to say we live where God was, not where he is. We master the old move. When the new move comes, we'll say, that ain't God. That ain't church. That's not a pastor. That's not what they look like. The old move fights the new move. And it's because we have done it for so long without God that we don't even recognize God when he's moving. <laughs> Y'all praying? Watch this. I remember a time when we did devotion. I am on the battlefield. You had the deacon to come out, he pull out a chair. He kneel, he stand, he kneel, he stand. I remember we did devotion. But then there was a move of God in the body. And we went from doing devotion to praise and worship. Instead of talking about where we are, where we came from, and how rough it is, now praise and worship is more God-centric. It changed from this way to this way. It's now vertical. And it's more about him than it is about us. And when that shift happened in the body of Jesus Christ, watch this, you had people who fought it and who still can't get with it because they don't realize there's been a shift in the body. And they're so consumed with how things are supposed to be. The Bible says this about the letter of the law. The letter of the law killeth, but the grace of God gives life. You've got to have a balance. You have to have the letter of the law, but you have to mix it with grace. And when you do that, it'll cause you to sense and perceive when the shift happens and you'll begin to shift with it. There was a time, anybody remember five night revivals? Your church had a revival this week. The next church had a revival this week. Everybody had a five night revival. There are people who call me now and want me to do a five night revival. I said, no, God moved. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He has moved away from that on my life. I followed the shift. Y'all ain't killing me. I do five nights and I got to come home and do all this. No, no, sir. Uh-uh. Y'all come let me do one of them nights and I'll be a blessing to your ministry. And, and then it went from five night revivals and then you remembered we, there was a, a whole movement that, that it shifted in the body where everybody was having a conference. Then you had Azusa. Then you had Woman Out Loose, Manpower, Megafest. And every individual church had their women's conference, the men's conference. Everything went to conferences. And now there's even a new movement where you got leadership trainings. You got church trainings. But people are doing trainings now, and they're teaching, and they're, and, they're, and they're equipping you with different things. There have been movements and shifts, and that's why you can't stay. You have to stay in the presence of God, because if you don't have the glory of God, you'll miss the shift. And to live in spirit of tradition, it means that you live in a dead place. Now, I'm going to help you here. I got to rush. I'm, I'm, I'm so far over this time. But there are seven ways to determine whether or not you need deliverance. I'm going to run real fast, so I need you all to get with it. And again, if you text me, I'll give you the number again at the end of service. I'll, I'll send it to you. Seven ways to determine whether or not you need deliverance. First way is, first of all, emotional problems. That's disturbances in your emotions that are persistent, that are ongoing, that are, you can't get rid of it. You can't break it. You can't get, get it out of your spirit. Here's some, here's some characteristics of, of what I mean when I say emotional problems. Resentment, hatred in your heart, anger, fear, rejection, feeling unwanted and unloved, self-pity, jealousy, depression, worry, inferiority, and insecurity. Emotional problems. 
Secondly is mental problems. These are disturbances in your mind or your thought process of your life. Mental torment. Watch this. Procrastination. Indecision. Compromise. Confusion. Doubt. Rationalization. And the loss of memory. You need deliverance. Speech problems. Uncontrolled use of your tongue. Lying. Cursing. I need deliverance. That was personal. Blasphemy. Criticism. Mockery. Railing. That means you just go on tangents and you do not let up. Gossip. You need deliverance. Sex problems. Fantasy sex experiences. Masturbation. Lust. Perversions. Homosexuality. Fornication. Adultery. Incest. Provocativeness. Harlotry. You need deliverance. Addictions. The most common addictions are, are, are these. Nicotine. Alcohol. Drugs. I'm going to add sex. Medicines. Starbucks. I'm sorry, that's not how it is in my nose. It says caffeine right here. And food. You need deliverance. Physical infirmities. Many diseases and physical afflictions are due to the spirit of infirmity that has attacked your body. This is when you, the doctors can't even medically understand and explain why you're experiencing and dealing with what you're experiencing. It might then be that a spirit of infirmity has arrested your body. And you can't seem to shake it, but they can't seem to explain it. That's a good cue that you might be wrestling with a spirit of infirmity that has come against you. And when a demon inf uh, inflicts pain from a spirit of infirmity, it leaves damage physically in your body. And you have to play, pray for even physical healing as a result of that. Then there's religious error, and that's just false doctrine, false teaching. You've fallen in line with compromising theological doctrine that allows you now to believe a portion of this, a piece of that, and a piece of that, which is all in error. If these are the things that you see, you need deliverance. Now, my guess, I would venture to say that in this room and even watching me online, in some of this, you have seen that you need deliverance. Let, let's be real. You've seen something in all of this that makes you know, oh, I need deliverance. As a matter of fact, some of you all didn't just see something. <laughs> Come on, let's be real today. You saw some things that say you really need deliverance. So, Pastor, how do I get this? What, what, what needs to happen? Y'all ask the best questions. Here it is. Seven things that need to happen. Seven keys to deliverance. I can send you this, but I'm going to actually put a disclaimer when I send it to you because I didn't write this. This was a compilation of myself, other pastors and preachers, and other literature that we pulled these things from, spiritual authorities that we have confidence are, are speaking straight out of the word of God. But I want to help. I want to help us realize that we need deliverance. This is why the enemy has been fighting me so hard because he knows that this is actually going to liberate somebody and cause their life to be delivered. Here's, here's the first thing. Number one, honesty. 139 number of Psalms, verses 23 and 24. 139, 23 and 24 says, search me, O God. Know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there's anything in me that's wicked in any ways that, that, lead me, that lead me away from the everlasting. Come on, help me, God. It's an honest admission that I need help. It's a confession. You have to come to a place where you accept what's going on in your life. Any program that you participate in, any psychological program, any, any self-help program, any, any program that you even participate in in a secular, they're going to they're gonna first and foremost say the first step in your recovery is that you got to have admission. 
you got to confess that you have a problem, that you need deliverance in this area of your life, and acknowledge that it is something that has a grip on your life. You all, listen, I need y'all to hear me. I have figured out in myself where my areas of sin are. And so the first step in recovery is I got to admit I got an issue right here. And I have, to, I have to confess that the key to change anything is to confess it or admit that it is a problem. Y'all think I be playing when I tell you that my greatest vice is right here in my mouth. I, I need you to understand that I don't say that to be comical and whimsical, but I say that because I recognize and confess I need to do something about this. Are you with me? You, you have to arrest this thing. And the only way to arrest it is you got to be honest about it. Well, let me tell you, and, and, and confession, is, confession is necessary. The Bible says if you confess your sins, then he is faithful to forgive. Forgiveness comes as a result of, of confession. But let me tell you why people are, are reluctant and hesitant to confess. Because there's a, the body of Christ has a weak immune system. Anytime you have an infection or anytime you have a, 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 a harmful element introduced inside the body, anytime you get a cut, there are cells that the body will send to that site to fight off whatever disease, infection, whatever, whatever cut, whatever ailment, they'll send the right cells that will heal itself. Your body heals itself. So the reason that people in the body of Christ are slow to confession is because the body no longer heals itself. They're not going to make confession because they're afraid of your judgmental response. And they don't know whether or not you're going to pray for them, stand with them, be with them, cover them, shield them, protect them, and help them into a place of healing, or if you're going to use whatever you get to kill them. <laughs> and so because of that, they're reluctant to get to the place of confession. And, you know, and, and, and again, that's why, I tell, that's why I tell my own struggle, because I don't care, I, you know, whatever. At the end of the day, what I figured out is that God will implement the grace of deliverance. And if you're not careful and cautious, it will cause, if you're not willing to confess that and be honest about it, you will never even acknowledge what you have and you will never be released from what you have. Are y'all with me? I knew it was going to be quiet in here. Wasn't nobody going to say amen on these. That's all good. Amen. Preach, boy. I'm going to tell it myself. I, I had to think about it and pray about it, but here it is. So this, this particular area. Because I admit that it is, a, it, is a, it is an area that I need deliverance, I have, I have literally watched how the enemy will take that, and he'll, he'll try to flip it, and he'll try to use it, and he'll slowly ease it back into your normal habitry until now it's manifested, and you execute it, and you exercise it, and it becomes damaging and harmful. I told y'all what mine is. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I ain't gay. Come on. But this is a weapon. And if I don't take authority over it, if I don't get control of it, if I don't tell the people around me to hold me accountable, it'll become comfortable and I'll just slip right back into a conversation that I'm really not supposed to have. I see, and it's, 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 it's always amazing because then people look like, oh my God, I can't believe that he does that. Oh, goodness. See, because I have now control over what my mouth is, I, I'm able to look at you and just say, God bless you and keep you and not tell you what I really want to tell you. <laughs> but let me tell on myself for a minute because I think that there's power in testimony. I think there's deliverance in somebody else hearing that you yourself, that the pastor, the pastor? Oh, yeah, the pastor. So watch this. I had gotten to a place where I had slipped back in and vacillated into the commonality of that that particular vice, that, that, that stronghold, that, dem that demonic principality that had arrested this area of my life. It was a demon possession that literally took authority over my mind, which caused my tongue to speak loosely. And my sons, I was in the middle of doing several things. And they got into contentious conversation. And they came in 
and they're both dumping it in front of me, and I'm trying to handle crisis over here, crisis over there, and they're in front of me with another crisis between the two of them. And before you know it, for the first time in the 16 and 14 years that they've ever been on the face of the planet Earth, I launched out, lashed out, and I cursed one of my sons. For the first time, they have never, and I just said a week before, oh, I've never said curse words to my sons. I've never, they, I don't even, I've never even slipped up around them. For the first time. And a few minutes later, the Holy Ghost said, you know better. I literally marched upstairs, and I was on the same phone call and told the person, you're going to have to hold on. And I repented to my son. I hugged him. I loved on him. I said, that was wrong. It should not have happened. I apologize. I repent to you, and I ask for your forgiveness. I, I meant what I said, but I should not have said it the way I said it. <laughs> Clap applause. That's great. I really didn't say that for you all to feel like, oh, that's our pastor. Our pastor is so great. No, because I might slip up again. <laughs> let's just be real, and let's be honest, and let's be human. But I said that to let you understand that I have to first admit honesty. When, you don't, when you're honest, then you'll act in humility. James 4, 6, and 7, I'm so far over my time. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Now that you've admitted it, you got to say, God, I need your help. Let me be real. I can't control this on my own. I can't handle this by myself. I can't do this. I need your help. That's humility. Here's the thing. You'll never get to humility until you get to honesty. Because you're not going to ask for help for something that you don't think you need help for. Once you admit you have a need, then the need will be met by God. And faith begins where your answers run out. When you're able to say, I don't have no answers. I don't know how to fix this. I don't know how to get this together. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know how to make it through this. I don't know how to resist this. I don't know how to be healed from this. I don't know how to get over this. When you get to the place where your answers run out, then God's answers step in. And you have to be humble enough to say, God, I need your help. Are y'all with me? And then once you get to that place, then you have to go into repentance. Here's the thing. There's a difference between confession and repentance. Confession is where people usually land. They usually say, I did it. I admit it. I cursed them. But repentance, repentance is saying, God, I don't want to do that no more. So let me do everything that I can and need to do to prohibit this from happening in the same way again. Are you with me? It is the changing of ways. And repentance is a holy act. Repentance is a blessing from God. It is an opportunity. Imagine that you were on a road and you were going the wrong direction and there was no way for you to get off. But repentance says you can get off. So re to repent is literally to change course or change directions. And what makes repentance so beautiful is that you can get off the road and you can go into a posture and a position that God says, now I'm going to give you my grace, my strength, and now I'm going to help you stay off of that road. So when, re when you tell God what you did, he will give you forgiveness. But when you repent and change your life, then you experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Repentance is, 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 an, is a, a holy act that many of us need to re appreciate because it is course correction. And then there's renunciation. After repentance, you then renounce it. You say, I'm, this is not who I am. I begin to speak and declare that this is who I'm going to be. Matthew 3, 7 and 8 says, but when you, watch this, this is very important. Thank you, Holy Ghost. But when, you, but when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees to come to his baptism and said unto them, O generation of vipers, have you not been warned to flee the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits of your repentance. He wants to see the fruit of your repentance. This means you might have to now take a year off of Facebook, Twitter, social media, Snapchat. Instagram. Yeah, it just got real right there. You, you, might, you might have to change jobs. You might have to lose friendships. You might have to change cities. But fruit of your repentance says, I'm going to do what I need to do 
in order not to go back that direction anymore. You may have to change your number. When you say I'm willing to get another way and go another way, you have to be committed to do it and bring forth the fruit that is necessary for your repentance to be pleasing before God. And most people never make it to this step because sometimes we just, we're content staying where we are. It's not deep. The prayers of renunciation is not deep. It's simply saying, God, I no longer, I will not, I shall not, I cannot, and I'm going to do these things to make sure that it does not. Are you with me? Ooh, it's quiet right there. And once you get into the place of repentance, then there's forgiveness. Matthew 6, uh, 14 to 15 says, God says, if you forgive, I'll forgive. If you don't, I don't. And one of the biggest traps I need you to understand, the first focal point of forgiveness is you got to forgive yourself. The enemy will cause you to beat yourself down for all the wrong that you've done, mistakes you've made, and you got to get to the point. Sometimes it's easier for us to forgive other people than it is ourselves. Because we feel so wretched and we feel so wrong and we feel so undone. And it's just a trick of the trap of the enemy that he causes guilt and shame and, and, and grief to take con control. And eventually now your spirit is now weighted and you're down and you're dismal and you're lamenting and you're repenting. And you think everybody hates me. everybody Nobody likes me. And they're looking at me with disdain. And, and they, they think I'm nothing and they think I'm garbage. And you'll beat yourself up and the devil won't have to lift a finger. So the first thing is that you got to learn how to forgive yourself. The second thing is you got to learn how to forgive other people. You're carrying burdens that don't belong to you. You're carrying the weight of hatred. And, 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 and here's the thing. you got to go to God and say, God, I need your help. I can't. I can't let this go. I keep getting mad about it. It keeps coming up in my conversation. I keep practicing and rehearsing it. I'm still angry. I'm still bitter. I'm still going through the same emotions, the same feelings. I can't get it. I'm still mad. I'm still angry. I'm still wounded. I can't get over this. I need your help. The spirit has attacked me. It's attacked my mind. And I need you to release my mind and control my heart that I can release this and let this thing go. That's because you need deliverance. Thank God you didn't die in it. Because there's some stuff that should have killed all of us. But he forgave us and gave us grace. See, where I, I, saw, I saw John Gray say this, say this last night, where karma should kill us, grace catches us. And, and then there's the sixth thing is prayer. Joel 2 and 32, and it shall come to pass, and whatsoever things you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. This is how you, this is when you talk to God. This is when you talk to God. But the problem is not, not that we don't know how to talk to God. We pray all the time. Here's the other part. This is number seven, warfare. That's when you talk to the devil. We know how to talk to God, but we're not really taught how to talk to the devil. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the way in of the devil. This is when you start binding and loosing, decreeing and declaring. This is when you start speaking to the devil and telling him that he has no power, no authority, that you begin to declare and decree over your children and your children's children. This is when you start loosing the power of God into your circumstance that it will re be changed and reformed. This is when you start binding the enemy and he will now have no, no, no free reign and free room in your body with your kids, with your, with your mind, with your peace, with your joy, over your mouth, over your heart, over your peace. This is when you start speaking to the devil and declaring that you're already defeated in the name of Jesus. This is when you start rebuking demonic spirits that have come into your household that have crept in and slowly started taking authority and control over areas of your life this is when you walk in and tell the devil i know who i am i got the confidence of god because christ jesus has given me victory and i'm no longer going to be subject to your authority but you now have to take the authority of jesus christ which is invested in me and you got to be dealt with accordingly here's when you know that you're free you know that you're free and you're walking in deliverance when these three signs are present. I got to go back to the text for one second. In the text, this woman had seven demons, seven demonic principalities, but she was delivered from them. How do you know that you're delivered? You follow the pattern of this woman's life. First of all, in Luke 18 and 2, you see that these women were serving Jesus Christ. 
She was willing to serve Christ, following him through territory, serving him. And when you're willing to serve God, you will know that you're walking in deliverance. And service is not a position in church. Because you can serve in church and still not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. <laughs> service is a 24-hour job where, where you're the same way on Sunday that you are on Saturday night. Service is you can go to their family picnic and the same things you would do in front of the church people, you will do in front of them. The same thing that you won't do in front of your pastor, you won't do it. Because service is acknowledging that God, I belong to you and I, I'm, here, I'm here as an ambassador and a representative of you and I want to serve you 24 hours a day. You'll know that you're delivered when you're willing to serve God. But you'll also know that you're delivered when you're willing to search for God. Matthew the 28, this is another passage, Matthew 28 and 1. Early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and Mary and the other Mary, they went to visit the tomb. She was the first one to go and look for Jesus. And when you really are delivered, you start seeking him. You want more of him. You got a prayer life. You get up in the morning and say, God, before I brush my teeth, before I get out of this bed, before I do anything else, let me see if I can find you in this place. I need you in my day. I need you for my kids. I need you in my life. You'll seek God in the daytime with a flashlight. You're always trying to figure out where can I get more? How can I get more? You're thirsty. You're hungry for the things of God. When you really are delivered, you nobody has to push you, remind you, prod you, or prompt you. Be, no, you don't have to have a B3. You don't have to have a keyboard you don't have to have the drums nobody you don't need a praise team when you're really delivered you will be looking for God in the cubicle of your office you'll go into the break room and you'll get in a corner you'll go outside to your car at lunch and you'll start fat believing God for extraordinary impartation of his glory when you really are delivered you start looking for God you literally want God. I need more, 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 more. God, more. I can't get enough of you. I, I need more. I need you. 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 I need you in my life, in my, in my business, in my body, in my mind, for my kids. I need you. I want you. I, I, I'm longing for you. I'm yearning. I'm like a deer that's panting for the water because the water is where I'm safe. The water is where I'm refreshed. The water is where I'm kept. The water is where I need to be. I'm looking for you, God. God, in every turn, I want you, I yearn for you, I need you, I know I need you more in my life. That's when you'll know that you're walking in deliverance. And even the cares of the world will come against you and try to keep you from wanting God. The distractions of daily life will prohibit you from wanting more of God. And then lastly, you'll know that you're delivered when you're willing to share what God has done. In John 20, 16 through 18, Mary came to the tomb. Jesus said, wait a minute, don't touch me yet. I got to ascend to my father. But turn around and go tell the disciples, go find my brothers and tell them that you've seen me and tell them what you've, what you've experienced. Here, here's the problem. Many of us can't walk in deliverance because we won't tell people how we've been delivered. You'll know you're delivered when you don't care who knows your issues. Come on, somebody. You'll know you're delivered when you can testify of what you've been through, what the mistakes you made and the fall, your failures and shortcomings and shortfalls of your own life. You'll know you're delivered when you're walking. He whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You'll know you're delivered when you can walk in and say, yep, this is what I did, but thanks be to God, I, I didn't stay where I was, that he brought me out. If it had not been for the grace and the mercy of God, I never would have made it this far. I should have been. I would have been and I could have been, but by the grace of God, she went and told the disciples everything God had experienced. She had experienced with Jesus and what she had seen. Here's the problem. Y'all are too tight-lipped. You too saved and caught up in yourselves and your image. You too sanctified and too holy and too pious to be honest with the fact that you got issues, that you need deliverance, that there are things in your life that God needs to release you from, that there are areas in your life that you still have a struggle, that the enemy is a trying to arrest your body and your mind and if you ever get to the point where you stop and throw off the garments of all of your self-righteousness and put on the garments of humility and start being candid and say God I messed up toe up from the flow up but 
I know that it was you that brought me. I'm still here. I need you to testify. I'm still here. I've fallen, but I'm still here. I made mistakes, but I'm still here. I've fallen short, but I'm still here. And when you start talking about it long enough, what's going to happen is the Holy Ghost is going to hit you and a spirit of appreciation and gratitude is going to overtake you until you can't help but to give God the kind of glory that he deserves. I just need about 30 folk in here that will praise God because you realize if it had not been for him on your side, you wouldn't be where you are. You wouldn't be who you are. You wouldn't have had what you have. You wouldn't have done what you've done. Somebody bless him and tell it. Come on 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 and tell it. They gonna know how much you've been through just by looking at how much you praise. Come on and tell it. They gonna see what he brought you out of just by looking at the level of your shout. Come on and tell it. He delivered you. Come on, tell it. Come on from a drug life, tell it. From prostitution, tell it. Come on, tell it. Tell it in this place. God did it. God did it. God did it. God did it. And I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I should have been. I would have been. And if you had your way, devil, I could have been. But I'm still here. If he did it before, he'll do it again. If he did it for all of us who are shouting right now, you ain't got nothing to worry about it because he loves you just as much as he loves me. If he delivered me, he can deliver you. If he brought them out of it, if he brought them off of it, if he got them through it, then he guess what? He can do the same thing for you.